person. Well, we all saw uh, John Swinney and Anna Sarwar uh, struggling to answer the very pointed questions put to them on Monday night by Douglas Ross, because their position on these issues relating to the future of the oil and gas sector, to be frank, are extremely dangerous for the future of the sector. Now, one of the criticisms that's most often levelled in this parliament, of this parliament, is that there are not enough people in here who have had experience of the world of business. Now, Daniel, now Daniel Johnson has, and I think that's why if his speech had gone on much longer, he would have struggled to defend the policy of his party, because listening to this debate, it's hard to argue with the criticisms that people level on the lack of business experience people in this chamber. Because what we've heard this afternoon is theory devoid of any real world context being bandied about by members who are in a complete state of denial about the reality of what is happening in the North Sea Basin. So let's take the Greens very briefly. They would just shut everything down. They've got no interest in the tens of thousands of people who work in the sector. Tess White is absolutely right. Patrick Harvey's comments were an insult to tens of thousands of families in the northeast of Scotland. Let's take the SNP. Their party campaigned for years on a slogan that Scotland's oil. Most you know, they expressed this repeatedly, but now a presumption against new oil and gas because that's what we've heard from that front bench for the last three years I've sat in this parliament. And there's no point denying it. And there's no point Kate Forbes trying to revise what's been said in this chamber by first ministers and others who have sat on that front bench. And they have argued in favour of swinging surtaxes on North Sea operations. They can't now say they're not in favour of it because frankly, in all honesty, we do not have straw for brains. We can remember what was said just last week or the month before or the year before. Now, don't insult the intelligence of the people of Scotland by portraying the SNP as the defenders of North Sea oil and gas. And then, and then let's take Labour. Let's take Labour. Now, you can never be sure, as we saw last night, you can never be sure of what any Labour policy is on anything. But industry bodies and trade unions are united in condemning Labour's current policy towards North Sea oil and gas. They warn that the consequences of additional windfall taxes and a presumption, no a banning, of new oil and gas will cost millions and millions and precipitate the demise of the whole sector. And Labour say, well, we don't want a cliff edge. We don't want a cliff edge. And then they expose their ignorance of how global capital flow works. I give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. W would he accept that the, the North Sea Basin is declining in terms of its output by 15% a year? And that, that is irreversible. And what's more, that essentially we're arguing about a difference in headline rate? Stephen Kerr. If you, if you threaten the flow of capital into what's already there by your policy, it won't be there at all. Very quickly, it will drop off a cliff. There is a constant need for new capital investment in the North Sea. And if there's no future for North Sea oil and gas, why on earth would anyone invest in the sector now? And then with Labour, there's the mystery of GB Energy. What on earth is GB Energy? Every time a Labour politician stands up to talk about North uh, GB Energy, they talk about something completely different. Apparently, it's an energy company that generates but doesn't generate energy. I have no idea what, your, what the Labour Party's policy is on this. And I go back to my original point. This can only be a policy worked up by careerist politicians and policy wonks who have no idea how the real world works. Only the Scottish Conservatives will stand up for the oil and gas sector and the tens of thousands of people whose livelihoods depend on it.